So today we need to talk about the potential for continuous distributions of charges, just like we did for the electric field. Let's start with the potential of a point charge. Start with what we know. So if this is the potential for a point charge, and if we follow the same kind of reasoning that we followed when we were talking about the electric field, then I can write the differential potential in terms of just dq over 4 pi epsilon naught, uh, 1 over r, the distance between the dq and wherever you're evaluating the potential. Uh, so this is what we use. Notice that instead of having some kind of vector equation with the electric field where you have to solve for three components, the potential field is just a scalar. So we only have one integration that we have to do instead of three. And we also don't have to mess with components. We don't have to say uh, the electric field has to be in this direction for some kind of symmetry reason. reason. So we multiply by the cosine of an angle and um, have to deal with that geometry as well. We don't have to do any of that. So it's a little bit easier to use the potential. And we kind of proceed in the same way. We find what dq is, we find what r is, write an integral we can solve, and uh, then do it. So let's first talk about finite lines of charge. Let's go lines and then disks. So for finite lines of charge, Let's say I start at x equals minus L and go to x equals L. So here we have the y-axis. And we'll put my point a distance d above the line. So this line has charge density lambda. Then this little charge element will be a distance r away. So for our dq, Just like what we did for the electric field, the dq will be lambda times dx. So we get our linear charge density and we multiply by differential length. So dq is lambda times dx. And then we need to find what r is. Well, we're integrating over x, so I can write r in terms of x by using the Pythagorean theorem. And just use square root x squared plus d squared. All right. So let's write our integral. V is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, integral dq over r. So in this case, we get our constant out front. And then we have integral. We're integrating over the x coordinate. And so I have to start here at x equals negative l. And I move to here, where x equals l. And then I get dq, lambda dx, over r, which is here, square root of x squared plus d squared. All right. Basically, we're done with the physics. We just have to solve this integral. So I can rewrite constants out front, lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught. And then what's the solution of this integral? You have dx over square root of x squared plus d squared. So this is pretty much um, dx over x, but we have this extra um, d squared bit. Really, look it up in your integral table, but it might be worth memorizing. Since it's pretty much 1 over x, we get a logarithm. So we get some kind of logarithm, and then if you look, you end up with logarithm of x plus square root of x squared plus d squared. And we go from negative l to l. So uh, this is just something I looked up. Um, and it's useful to memorize because when we're finding the potential, we have to deal with 1 over r a lot. And you end up with the square root of some variable that you're integrating over plus the some maybe some other thing, like a straight line. All right, or I can write this as lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught, and then I get logarithm 
the upper limit divided by the lower limit. So the upper limit is L plus square root of L squared plus D squared and divided by negative L plus square root of L squared plus D squared. Okay. So that's the solution for finite lines of charge. We didn't have to deal with any components or any kind of uh, finding the cosine of theta and some symmetry argument to find which electric field component we want at the point we're evaluating. And really this equation, the second line from the bottom, is the general solution for points around finite lines of charge. Because I can just change what my limits are. For example, in your exercise, you're going to start with a line that starts at zero and goes to L. All you have to do is make this lower limit zero. And then you have to uh, decide what D is. So you can change the limits and you can change D to put your point anywhere around this finite line that you want and then just evaluate uh, what you end up with to get your final solution. Okay. So something interesting happens when we take the length of the charge to infinity. Remember, we did electric fields for infinite lines of charge, and for some reason, I wanted to evaluate the potential only for finite lines of charge. Well, let's take L to infinity and see what happens. So we're interested in what happens to the potential as the length goes to infinity. Okay. If this is infinity plus infinity, some uh, little bit more than infinity, and then this is just a little bit more than infinity minus infinity, so we have a very small number here, a relatively small number here, and on top we have an infinite number, an infinite quantity. So logarithm of infinity is infinity. Logarithm uh, continues to increase as L increases without limit. Uh-oh. Our potential is infinite for an infinite line of charge. What happened? It exploded, right? So, we could see this a different way. Let me, instead of looking at this, start with an infinite line of charge So if I have my infinite line of charge, lambda, and I know what the electric field is up here. The electric field is going to be lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught, 1 over y. Let's say my coordinates are set up this way, x and y, y hat. Then my potential is the negative integral of the electric field over a distance. I'll make my distance coming from infinity to some distance d above the line um, in this direction. So v is going to be negative lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught integral. We're starting at infinity and we're going to d of 1 over y dy. So we're integrating along y now to get the potential. The integral of this is a logarithm like you would expect. So b is minus lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught. Hey, John, quick question. All right, just for the record, this is the other one called zip lock there. Just, just, log of uh, d over infinity, and then if I make this a positive sign, I just change the order that this goes in. So the potential is lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught, logarithm of infinity over d. So again, we have an infinite potential. Either way we do it. The bottom line is our boundary condition has been ruined. Because remember, I said when we were talking about the potential, 
that the potential, ener uh, potential energy of a distribution of charges, or at least a localized distribution of charges, goes to zero as you get far away from it. But this is an infinite line. It's not localized around any point. There's still charge way out here in infinity, and so I can't get away from it. This boundary condition is ruined. And so I can't define uh, my potential at any arbitrary point around an infinite distribution of charge with reference to infinity. There's no zero point energy here because I can't get far away enough from the, the charge. What I can do instead is talk about finite differences. So instead of moving from infinity to D, let's, ins let's just move some finite distance above the charge. So maybe from A to B in this direction. So now my potential, to emphasize that it's a finite change in potential, I'll use delta V is minus integral EDL just like we had before. So we end up with negative lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught integral starting at A and going to B of 1 over y dy. And this is perfectly well defined. I just get um, that the change in potential is lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught. And then I have to switch the order. I get log A over B because I use the negative sign here to switch the order. And so a uh, finite change in potential around a infinite distribution of charge is perfectly well defined, but you can't talk about the potential with reference to the zero point energy at infinity. It's not possible to do. So around infinite uh, distributions of charges, we can only talk about finite differences in the potential, which will serve our purposes uh, perfectly well. All right, so see if you can solve the first problem on the exercise, and then we can start talking about disks of charge. For a disk, if you'll recall, I'm going to have a finite disk of radius r, and I want the potential a distance z above the axis of the disk. So. Just like I did for the electric field, I'm going to use dq as this ring of charge. And so r here is this distance between the point here at z and this line element, this charge element, this ring here, uh, which is a distance rho away from the center or the axis of rotation of the disk. So let's write our integral. dq is sigma, I have a surface charge density, so I need to multiply by an area. I use the circumference of this ring, and I multiply by its thickness, its infinitesimal thickness, the rho. And then R is a triangle with rho on one side and z on the other, so I get the square root of z squared plus rho squared for R. So I can write V is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught integral. I start with rho at 0, and I take rho to R. And then I get dq in the numerator, sigma 2 pi rho d rho. And I get R in the denominator, square root of z squared plus rho squared. Let me simplify. V is sigma over 2 epsilon naught integral 0 to, rho, uh, 0 to r rather of rho over square root. I'll put rho first since it's the variable we're integrating over. Rho squared plus z squared d rho. All right, you should be able to do that just by inspection, really. If you want, you can use a u substitution. Uh, notice if I make u rho squared plus z squared then du is just 2 rho. And since I have a rho in the numerator, I can just use a direct u substitution. 
and the 2 is cancelled by the 1 half from the square root. So if I solve the integral, I get that the potential is sigma over 2 epsilon naught, and my square root of rho squared plus c squared. Oops. I get square root rho squared plus c squared uh, from 0 to r, or sigma over 2 epsilon naught square root of r squared plus c squared minus c, which is the final answer for the potential along the axis of a finite disk of charge with surface charge density sigma and radius r. All right, so let's do the same thing we did for the line. What happens if I take r to infinity? It's easier to see here, if I take r to infinity, my potential explodes, right? If r is infinite, it doesn't matter what z is. This term is infinite, so it doesn't matter what sigma, or eps, or sigma is. And uh, I have the same problem here with the potential exploding at, um, for infinite distributions of charge. But I can do the same trick I did before and look at finite uh, differences in potential instead of referencing the zero point energy at infinity. And so let's do that. I'll do one real nice. Uh, above an infinite sheet of charge with charge density sigma, we know that the electric field is constant. The electric field is just going to be sigma over 2 epsilon naught times, I don't know, let's make it y hat again. OK. So. If I integrate over the distance, I get negative integral of sigma over 2 epsilon naught. There's no y coordinate to integrate over. I just have to do a dy. And so the potential goes like the coordinate y. And so if I increase y, my potential will increase or decrease uh, without bound. If I increase y to infinity at infinite distance away from the charge, I get an infinite potential. So now let's do a finite one. Yeah. So we're going to do the same thing here, but I'm going to make my path. Uh, let me let me draw it out real nice and do a uh, line integral for you guys. Here we'll have the electric field. So the electric field in red. And then I'm going to be moving along the path uh, from this point, I don't know, x, y, to this point, x prime, y prime, along this path, a distance d, and at an angle theta to the electric field. So here we're not parallel or perpendicular, we're moving at some angle with respect to the electric field. All right, so I'll write it out step by step. V is integral E dot DL. So what's DL here? Well, we're not going along any axis. I can't just write that DL is like um, dy times y hat. Instead, I have to have some component in the x direction and some component in the y direction. And E, we know what E is. It's the same as before. It's sigma over 2 epsilon naught y hat. So V is minus integral E dot DL. So the x component dotted onto y is 0. I'll just write it out. Sigma is 2 or over 2 pi epsilon naught y dot dx x hat plus sigma over 2 epsilon naught y hat dot dy y hat. y hat dot x hat is 0, and y hat dot y hat is 1. So my potential is
my change in potential is the integral integral over y. Well, I start at y and end at y prime. So my lower limit is y, my upper limit is y prime of sigma over 2 epsilon naught dy. Or if I evaluate that, delta v, I get negative sigma over 2 epsilon naught y prime minus y. But if you look, if I subtract y prime from y, I get this distance here, which is d sine theta. So the change in potential is just negative sigma d over 2 epsilon naught sine theta, which is the change in potential moving at an angle of theta defined over there, a uh, distance d through a constant electric field produced by an infinite sheet of charge. So ju just like we did for the electric field, I have to talk about lines, then disks, and now we can move on to dipoles. It's not a continuous distribution, but uh, we can just kind of tack it on to the end of this one. So if I have my dipole, let's put it at the origin. I got my positive charge and my negative charge along the y-axis, I suppose, and they are a distance away from each other. So this distance here is d, right? Just like we have for the dipole moment. If I'm evaluating the potential out here at a point, um, let's say this point is at some distance r away from the origin. There's a different distance, some small difference between the dis distance um, that you have to go for the positive charge and the distance from the point to the negative charge. So I have some uh, r plus and r minus, which are slightly different from one another. I can write the potential immediately using the principle of superposition as just the sum of the potential from the positive charge and the potential from the negative charge. So let's do that. I get q over 4 pi epsilon naught, because they have the same sign, or the same magnitude of charge, they're a dipole. And then I get 1 over r plus, and then plus or minus, since uh, v negative is, or v minus is negative, r minus. And I can simplify that by writing it with a common denominator. I have to multiply them together. I get r minus over here on the left and r plus on the right. So r minus minus r plus. And in the denominator, I get their product, r plus r minus. So this is exact. But let me use the dipole approximation that the distance from the dipole is much larger than the distance between the charges. And kind of blow up the picture here, zoom in, and look at what I can, what kind of approximations I can make. Okay. So if I'm very close to the dipole now, the r plus and r minus as they go off are almost parallel to one another. And the, of course the charges are a distance d apart. So if this is r plus and this is r minus, r minus you have to go a little bit longer than you have to go for r plus. Look, r plus here is closer to this point than r minus is. So if these are parallel, then if I drop this leg down here and form a triangle, they're the same distance if you neglect this piece. If I neglect this piece, this is just two lines that are the same, that are completely parallel to each other, um, that are the same length. That means that R minus is larger than R plus by this amount, this distance here. And so if I define this angle, theta, to be the angle between the um, dipole axis and the point I'm interested in, this angle here, I can write r minus minus r plus, this difference in distances, as this distance here.
if this is D, the hypotenuse of this triangle, it's opposite the right angle, and this is my angle theta, this is the adjacent side, so this difference in length is D sine theta in this approximation. And the two, the product of the two dis distances, if D is very small, are going to be approximately the same as the distance r, the true distance, from the origin to the particle squared. Hey, my controller, Tatiana Stringfellow, Noah Leal, Nicholas Leal, Kaya Driver, Antoine Gilbreth, Kevin Harvey, and Rihanna Holmes. Please come to the attendance office. Any error that I have in this approximation here will be on the order of d squared. Since I'm squaring these two distances, this approximation actually gets better when I multiply them together because I'm multiplying a small number by itself and so I get an extra small number. That means that I can write the potential V as Q over 4 pi epsilon naught and then the term in parentheses here I get R minus minus R plus which is D sine theta and in the denominator R squared. I was just coming from so I have this term Q times D over 4 pi epsilon naught times, I'm sorry, this is the cosine. It's the adjacent side, so it's cosine. Cosine theta over R squared. Q times D, this is the dipole moment P. And so my final answer, I get B is P cosine theta over 4 pi epsilon naught 1 over r squared. So that's the potential around the dipole. Notice that this solves the potential everywhere around the dipole. I don't have to just limit myself to um, the axis of the dipole like we did when we were calculating the electric field. And if I take the derivative here of the potential, I get the electric field back. So that's kind of the utility of using the electric potential, using the scalar field, doing this calculation, and then taking the derivative to find the electric field, because I can do that everywhere. But it would, it would require uh, doing this derivative in spherical coordinates. And um, it's not the same as for just Cartesian coordinates. I'd have to teach you how to do that. But in practice, that's what's done to find the electric field around the dipole.